female, mostly ladies in here. You're a king. You're not a queen bee. You're a king. King's dominion. The word kingdom is actually two words. It's the king's dominion. It's his domain, whatever he operates in. Well, you know that all of you have this capability. Amen. So if we're recording this today, all of you can pay attention. You can learn a lot just from that one word, kingdom, king's domain. So in the, in the Bible, there is gender-specific things. Um, they really left no respect for women. Amen. But now and today, because of the finished work of Christ, this should, should have been 2,000 years ago. Women should have been elevated. And Paul did. He used a lot of women. Uh, for you ladies in here, there's nothing to um, tell you that you're weaker or less qualified than a man. You can do everything a man can do. Uh, in this ministry, most of you are allowed to do whatever you want. Amen. You can go and pray for anybody, anytime. You have my full endorsement. Uh, there are some churches that still... They still frown upon women taking an elevated role in a church, but not here. Amen. How can we say women cannot do them when they don't want to give birth to everybody? If you women say no, then nobody get born. King's domain, king's dominion. You are all kings and priests. Amen. There's uh, three anointings we talk about, the kingly anointing, the priestly anointing, and the prophetic anointing. Uh, everybody usually has one of those kind of geared into who you are. And some can operate in all three. Some can operate in only one. And uh, lots of times uh, churches like to tell you that you can't operate in any till I tell you you can. Bogus. Okay. So what are you going to get out of today? Well, I don't know. I don't know. If we unscrew that managed jar, let's see what's in there. Yeah? Pickles. Pickle mango. Or pickles. Uh, pickle juice. Okay, so let's read if you can. Yeah, everybody kind of close, you can see. Okay, there's only one battle in what we refer to as the kingdom of God. You guys know that everybody talks about the kingdom of God, but it's never capitalized in the Bible. But for the sake of the notes, we capitalize it today. And also, we're going to be talking about Satan. Uh, we're not here to empower Satan because he was defeated at the cross. But in the terms of your friends and family who don't understand the enemy or the devices of the demonic will use, for the sake of the argument, will use the name Satan today. So some of you are going to try, oh, but pastor, shut up. Anyway, people are always looking for an argument. Okay? So there's only one battle what we refer to as the kingdom of God. And this is it. Okay? It's a battle over what type of seed you allow to grow in the soil of your mind, which moves down into your heart. So there are two realms, basically. If you want to talk about heaven and hell, heaven is in your heart, right? Everybody agree with that? Hallelujah. So your mindset must be a hellish kind of place. Because it can conjure up all kind of evil anytime it wants. And all, how many know that it has to be semi, quasi hellish because the enemy has access to it? Otherwise, where would the battle be if you didn't have a brain? Well, some of you try and medicate yourself down to no brain. But... The thing is, the enemy just wants to drift these thoughts. What he's trying to do is get the thoughts. Because there's two minds, according to the Bible, the mind of your mind and the mind of your heart. So he wants to get the mind, your head, he wants to get those thoughts down and have it filtered down into your heart and become a part of you so you can never change. And that's what he did in your previous life, be your B.C. days before Christ. He would throw thoughts in there, he would filter down into your heart. That's why everybody talks about, oh, he broke my heart. She broke my heart. <laughs> why? Because your head was broken, your heart got broken too? If your heart was broken, how come you're still beating? All right. So two minds, okay? So kind of hang in there with me. Lesser crowds, are gonna, I want to teach more. You know, when, we get, when we get more people, I got to kind of surface skim the stuff so they don't get it. All right, so, you, you know, we're fishing. We're trying to get them to come back. All right. So the battle is over the seed. And the seed of the mind wants to become the harvest in the heart. And vice versa, the seed of your heart wants to become the harvest of your mind. So God is uh, provisioning out a, a virtual farm inside of you that is supposed to give you a perpetual harvest in your mind. So there's two battles going on all the time. 
Uh, if you ever wonder to yourself, I mean, you know that the word wonder always has a question mark attached to it. And then you know that's usually not God, unless you're questioning where it is in the word. Not what the word is trying to say. Because your heart, according to Paul in Romans 10, it tells you that the word is near you already. It's pre-installed software. It's in your, in your mouth and in your heart. So if it's in your heart, that harvest is trying to grow into your mind to dominate and take over that dominion, that realm, so that the enemy's thoughts have no, no, no anything over you, right? It would be like a kite flying into the tree. You get stuck. So that's what the, the beauty of the word is that the Lord wants you to catch these things and then dispose of it quickly. Okay? But a lot of people, they don't do that. They have weakness in the mind. That's why the mountain, the mindset always tries to exercise dominion over spiritual things. The, I don't know. I, I, I bless a lot of houses on a daily basis. And a lot of people tell me, oh, spooky. Okay. What makes it spooky? Okay. Because chicken skin, or you see things, you hear things. Well, the spooky part is your mind has told you to respect that. To fear that. How I many you know fear and respect kind of go hand in hand? So if you can say, ah, there's nothing. Some houses I go to, to be honest, there's nothing in the house. It's just the house making sounds because the house is moving all the time. How I mean, you know that everything has a vibration attached to it? That's how they measure things in science, right? Everything has a, has a vibration to it. So even my, the sound of my voice is a vibration. They have studied um, rocks. How I many you know that granite at a base level? How I many you have granite countertops? Well, if you have granite, how I many you know that it was the base rock of the earth? That was what uh, made the earth the same temperature all the way around according before Noah. So what happened is the collapsing of the firmament blew out the granite from the inside because according to the word, the water came forth. It didn't just rain. The covering over the earth, which made it a terrarium, collapsed. Why? Because the granite, which was, I guess it was like a nuclear kind of warming uh, thing, kept the whole earth the same temperature. When that exploded, God's hand of protection came off the earth. It exploded and it broke the firmament. And the firmament came raining down. And the waters from within, which were heated to keep the earth the same temperature, all of a sudden that blew out. So now you find granite in varying areas throughout the earth. And when they analyze granite, how I mean, you know that down to the highest microscopic component, they can see that it was created by vibration. And vibration comes from words. I think it was at UCLA, they bombarded water. They took sound and they took it to the highest level. And what they did was they bombarded water, just regular water with sound. And what happened is the water caught fire. Interesting. So what happens is God creates things. And same like you, your creative DNA. When you speak something into the atmosphere, you speak a vibration out that has to cause an effect somewhere. Now, I'm not trying to be scientific with you guys because all of us never pay attention. We went science class, just forget the C and get the hell out of there. Eh? But some of you are smart like that. You like science. Okay. So I just appeal to the nerd in you if you're a science person. Okay. So everything has a vibration. So granite, again, has these uh, vibration impact zones in the granite where it looks like some kind of energy spoke at it. And it created itself. So anyway, so I don't know. What am I trying to say? Well, the word always verifies what God is doing. Amen. The world always tries to verify the word. But the word verifies man's existence. Man is always trying to, uh, trying to qualify God. I mean, uh, God is resting. He, don't care. he left it to us. So the king's dominion, the king's domain has become our domain. So whatever we want in this earth, how I mean, you know you gotta just believe and then speak to it and, and watch what happens. All right? There's a lot of people speaking a lot of rubbish out here. How I mean, you know that it can find a destination. Some people's words cause me want to commit murder. Anyway, Amen. that's the truth. Amen. Because it's cause and effect, right? Everything has cause and effect. Hallelujah. So everything in life, safety wise, they're always trying to create something that um, prevents accidents or minimizes 
the impact of accidents. But how you know that words are an accident looking for a place to happen? So you got to watch your words because if you speak, I'm broke, how you know that? That has to come and try and find a destination in you to make you broke when the reality is you're not broken, but your life is kind of a shamble, so you think yourself to be broken. All right? And in your notes today, you'll see two definitions. You can see them in big words already. But let's read this opening narrative that was 25 minutes. or No, nah, just play. <laughs> so seed. What we allow to grow in the soil of our mind, which moves down into our heart. The enemy wants you to believe poverty-filled words over the word of God so that you, they can exert their kingdom dynamics and will in your life. So they want you to believe something that you're really not so that you take a lesser position. That's all it is. And what are we as the grace-filled, holy of holy church? We are seated. Now, I'm going to repeat this every service. So if you say, oh, you always say that, shout up your head until you get it. Because when you finally get it, every time I say it, you'll get excited about it. I don't see excitement. So we're going to keep saying it. All right? All right. Kingdom dynamics. They have a kingdom too. And they want their dynamics to rule over your flesh. So how many know that they want their words to rule over your head so that your heart becomes impoverished, which is a word of poverty. Okay. Now... Guard against the, those or these attacks by planting the incorruptible seed of God's word in your heart and capturing negative thoughts immediately with the word. So anytime you get this theory like, oh, I don't think I can. The word says, I can. Amen. Every time you think, oh, I don't have enough money. The word says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches. So you got to believe that God has riches at work in your life. And he's just trying to get it from your heart up to your head. And the enemy's trying to get these thoughts in your head down to your heart. So, hallelujah. So where's the determining factor on who wins? Your words that match the word. You guys get that? Am I, am I, am I putting these notes together for nothing? You all get it? All right, poverty. Now, check these two words out. Poverty and prosperity. Right after the word is what kind of word it is. What does it say? It's a noun. Everybody say noun. I said everybody say noun. <laughs> you guys are not hearing too good? A noun, according to Schoolhouse Rock when we were growing up, is a person, place, or thing. You guys know what a person, place, or thing is? It's a noun. And what is a noun? A person, place, or thing. So what is a person, place, or thing? A noun. Okay, now I got your attention. What you probably understood without really understanding it is that poverty was just kind of a, a floater, like something that could be might. But actually, according to the dictionary, these are both nouns. So which one are you? Well, poverty is the state of being poor or a lack of something. Some people have a lack of everything upstairs. So we don't want to be that kind of church. We want to be a church or a believer. How many of you are a believer, first of all? That qualifies you to be a prosperous person if you're a believer. If you're an unbeliever, that lends itself to you being an impoverished person or a person in poverty. Because how many know a rich person, in order for them to be rich, have to believe that they're going to be rich. And then it takes its course to be Rich or deliver riches in their life. But if you come out of a place, uh, I'm speaking from personal experience. I came from a place that's very impoverished and so are the brains in there. You know when the teachers told all the kids from Lanakila that you're smart. You know what we think to ourselves? Huh? Anyway, we always wonder and think about like how can I not rich? When the Bible says that you are all these things, you just got to manifest these things. And you can also say that people may be in the homestead, down Kilgar, or maybe if you come from a small town someplace, some people would say homestead down across KTA, right? Whatever, or wherever it is. How many know that? It doesn't matter. I know some people that were brought up in very wealthy households that are screwed up in the head. They did not believe. Amen. That's why it's 
positive reinforcement. And so I, I started several years back thinking about all the things my teachers would say about me, like, oh, shows much potential. Okay, well, how you know that showing potential and walking in your potential is two different things. So I used to gauge myself because I grew up poor looking at other kids that had money. And you know what happened when I... When, when I entered adulthood, I started thinking about my, my past, and I started thinking about all these kids. And you know what the mistake was? I started thinking that the kids I went to school with were rich. But the kids weren't rich. The parents was rich. So that told me, like, wait a minute. Those guys wasn't rich. Just their mother and father was working. And my parents would take turns working. Uh, my dad would work until payday. And then he would take off for one week. And then he would go back to work. Because he likes to lock them up. Yeah. And I started thinking, the only difference was that their parents had a condition where they showed up for work and got a regular paycheck. In our house, we had six kids. And my mom wasn't working until I went to high school. So the thing was, I was thinking to myself, what was the big difference between them? Nothing. So we start at a young age being conditioned by the enemy into thinking, we don't, we don't have the nice clothes like they do. We don't have the toys like they do. Uh, my theory was growing up, if I didn't have it and they had it, I was going to borrow it long term. <laughs> you got you to gotta kind of get out of that. Now, you know, even today, okay, even today, as successful, if you want to deem that as successful, when I walk into a store, I'm always looking around at how I could get away with stealing from the store. Even though I get money to buy them, I'm looking, oh, I could get away with this so easy. And I always think along those lines. If I see a bike that's not chained up, you know what in my mind I'm thinking? That's mine. I just got to pick them up. Stuff like that. Amen. If I see a pen on the ground, because I grew up with only pencils and half of them weren't sharpened. If I see a pen on the ground, if you hang out with me, you know I'll take that pen. I'll say, oh, God has blessed me with a pen. Because we didn't have pens growing up. Only the rich kids had pens. The only time we had pens was the beginning of the school year. And my mom would try and scrape it together. Because she had six kids to provide for. So pens always had a logo on it. Why? Because you're going to take them from the hotel. You're going to take them from the bank. You're going to take them from whatever, yeah? So poverty and prosperity, two distinct differences. But the one similarity is that they are both nouns. Things. So, understandably, words are things. According to the Bible, the Word of God is a thing. It's a noun. So, when you speak something, I mean, you, know, you have to own something for it to be yours. So, you got to own the Word of God. So, poverty, again, is a noun, but it's also the state of being poor. Which state, though? Huh. You see, you can be poor in health. You can be poor in wealth. Well, you can be poor in relationships. But the state of being poor is always a mental state. Because it has to be in your brain, you know, that I'm going to do it and I'm going to overcome no matter what. Did you know that if you believe to the highest level that God is in control of your life and that he will deliver things, how many know that the Bible says that he will use all manner of men to deliver to you? The delivery system of God is it won't be delivered to you until you think correctly and speak correctly to your prosperity, which is also a noun. What is prosperity now? It's a successful a person who's successful, flourishing, or thriving condition. So you have to be successful in your mental state for these things to deliver itself to you. Okay? Especially in financial respects, good fortune. Now, the Chinese always believe that good fortune follows you if you do the right thing. But there's always a balance. Yeah? Chinese, always a balance. That's where the yin and the yang or the town and country logo, the black and the white, even. But in the Bible, it makes no provision for that. It says when you go through something, you will go through stuff. But it's okay. God is going to show himself strong on your behalf. So the yin and the yang doesn't really counterbalance the right way. It's the white over the black. It's not side by side. It's a little different, right? Uh, prosperities is another word for prosperity. Prosperous circumstances characterized by financial success or good fortune. So all of you in here, you are entitled because of the prosperity of God to 
things, other nouns being delivered to you. Uh, being healthy is also a noun. Amen? Uh, the verb in, in being healthy is what you do proactively to promote your own health. Okay, so we believe in nouns, right? Are you a noun? You're a person. You're a person with whichever of these two you choose to be on any given day. If you're prosperous, you're prosperous. You believe that, nothing bad can happen to you. And when bad things do arrive, because the enemy has a delivery system too, when he delivers something, we know that God will deliver something to trump that. It's a constant game of trumps or spades, wherever you come from. Okay, now we can get to the notes here. All right. Now, man, you can read read this. What does it say? Man was created to have dominion and establish the kingdom of God on earth. That's simple, right? God didn't put man on earth for him to become subject to a lesser enemy. He put man on earth to flourish. Now, if you've listened to the previous sermons to this, you hear uh, what we believe here, that God's grace put them outside of the garden when they failed so God could rescue them on the other side. In the enemy's camp... Because how I many you know that, well, the Garden of Eden was God and Adam's domain. Now, he gave that to Adam and Eve. All right? So they owned it. So God was just a visitor. He would come and walk with them according to the word. So that means that Adam and Eve owned the Garden of Eden. God would come as a guest to come and visit with them. God wasn't trying to exert control and dominion over man. He created man to be equal in relationship. So he comes in the cool of the day to come and visit with them. So how do you, how's it going? Everything good? How's the garden? You like it? You're enjoying it? Do you like what I created for you? Until they allow a lesser enemy to come drifting through and take dominion over what God had given them. So as God puts them outside of the garden and puts the flaming sword with the angel, I mean, God's mercy, because they already delivered themselves outside into the wilderness. The garden was contaminated. He had to put the contaminated man and woman outside so the contamination wouldn't filter into the garden. So he now has to come back on the other side and rescue man. He didn't kick him out. He, they put themselves in a place that God had to come. In the flesh now, because of the wilderness, he has to come outside of the garden in the form of a man to rescue them. But in all ways, the word says, without sin. So he comes on the other side of the garden. Remember, when Jesus comes out of the water, reestablishes his relationship with his father when he gets baptized by John the Baptist. Now, I'm giving you guys review. Some of you look at me like. When he gets baptized, Jesus comes in the flesh, right? He's born of a woman, not contaminated, no same blood supply as man. He comes, he gets baptized in water. God reestablishes himself in Jesus. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Now he is put back into the wilderness to defeat the enemy on his own turf. But there's one turf that had to be dealt with is the turf which we are created from. Every man, woman, and child is created from the dust of the earth. So after this temptation in the wilderness, which Jesus, by the way, defeated, he won that battle. How many know that now he goes and he starts to show how he's redeeming man. So he begins to use dirt as creative particles. Amen. So he takes a part of himself, mixes it with dirt, and creates brand new eyes. So I hope people are listening to this today. They could get a lot out of this. So what happens now is Jesus goes all this way and religion has to come in because that's the final battle to defeat or try and kill Jesus in the flesh. So Jesus allows them to kill the flesh off. Amen. So the flesh can go into the earth and come back now complete and whole again as a gardener. I know it gets deep, bro. <laughs> it gets real deep. Don't ask me how I understand all of these things. All I know is God took me through Lanakil Housing, the bookmobile, the library, reading, understanding people, to working with drug addicts in a, in a high school setting as a peer counselor, to taking me to preschool to just deal with abused children, and then to the jail, and then into ministry. The most evil thing out of all of that is ministry. 
I promise you that. And it's not the people that call us for help. It's the ones in ministry already who think they know everything and they know nothing. If I crack open the jar of religion on people, I look inside, no more even gumballs in the machine. No more nothing. The gumball machine hiding behind this counter get more gumballs than most pastors out there. Hallelujah. You guys good? <laughs> All right, so if you want more review, go listen to this online. Take notes. Try and study what I'm saying because I cannot catch you up all in one sermon. Okay, that was just my opening statement. And we at 11 o'clock already. No, it's never enough time to explain it all. So you got to get it in bits and pieces. I'm sorry. That's why it's important for the ladies who are over analytical to get together in. Anyway, all right. Do your thing, ladies. All right. Satan wanted to be like God and he was cast out of heaven because of his desire. So he was thrown out of heaven and he came out and a third of the angels fell with him. I mean, you know that now he begins his own tactics. He has his own kingdom and he tries to infiltrate God's kingdom. The, the beauty of everything is this. God gave the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve, but he allows the devil himself to come into the garden to test them. Say Amen. Because God's beauty and grace is that He will allow calamity in your life to see how much you believe and how you believe. He goes, how do you know that He is still studying your head? God usually has no clue what we're thinking in our head. You know why? Because He's left and entrusted everything to us that we're going to do the right thing. And usually we screw it all up and then we come running to God. And you know what He says? No more gum in the machine. Uh, if you want to learn about the fall of Lucifer, who was in charge of worship in the heavenlies with God, how many know that God knew Lucifer personally? He created him, amen. So the, the funny thing is a created being thought he could take over the creator. Babouge. Anyway, all right. And this is how it all kind of goes down. This is God speaking about Lucifer in Isaiah, right? You guys wrote that down or you got it? Isaiah 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. So already you know Lucifer was a lighted up being, right? And he came down and gave Joseph Smith two plates. Anyway, some of you catch that later. <laughs> He's an angel of light. And that's the, the Bible talks about angels of light. So not every light you see is an angel. It might be a light bulb. You left them on and you open your eye. Oh my God, it's God. No, it's not. It's a light bulb. Okay. <laughs> my friend one time, he got, he got so wasted one night and he slept. He fell asleep with a lamp right by his face. And he opened his eyes and then he was like, bro, you can't pray for me. I see white dots everywhere. I said, what? I said, what happened? He didn't tell me how it all happened. He got drunk and went home. And he was fiddling with the lamp and fell asleep. And he used to sleep with his eyes half open. Some of you know people like that. Sleeping with the lamp in his face. And he got up and he said, bro, I, can't, I think I'm going blind. But you in ministry, ah, right? you pray for people, I need prayer. So I asked him, what happened? He said, oh, well, I don't know. I got away. So I woke up, the lamp was on. I said, where was the lamp? Right in my face. I said, I know you. You sleep with your eyes half open. He go, so, so it's, it's not me going blind then. I don't want glaucoma or anything like that. I said, no, just close your eyes for about three days and you'll be all right. He'll go, okay. And he did. He went home. He slept in a dark room for three days. You see, not everything is as it seems, amen, because some of you have done some stupid stuff. Another guy, one time, <laughs> this is a true story, he came to me and had a big Fred Flintstone on his forehead, you know, big lumps, okay, and boom, and boom. And he said, I don't, I don't remember how that went happened. I said, Rana, what, uh, how did you figure out? He said, all I know is I was lying on the ground by my ladder, and my hammer was next to me. And I got up, and I was thinking to myself, I got a headache. I went in the house. I looked in the mirror. I had a big lump. He said, one well, big lashka on my whole head. And I said, and you didn't figure this out? I think you fell or a hammer hit you in the head. He go, you know what? You could be right. 
I said, better I figure them out for you so when you go ER, you can explain what happened instead of having some medical establishment try to figure out the hammer versus the ladder theory. He said he was putting Christmas decorations on his gata, and he don't know what happened. Last thing he remember was waking up on the ground with a hammer next to his head. So I deduced two things. Either he fell off the ladder or he hit himself in the hammer with the hammer on the ladder. Which could be possible because this guy wasn't the brightest bulb in the chandelier hanging up Christmas lights. Okay. <laughs> okay. All that to say, how you are fallen, oh Lucifer. <laughs> oh boy. All right. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. All he's saying is that, okay, Lucifer is in charge of worship. So the congregation, he, he's in charge of worship. He presents the glory back to God. Amen. The worship brings about glory that he presents to God and he takes glory from God and presents it to the congregation. So he stands in the midst of all of this. Ezekiel 28, if you read it, also talks about this. But God is telling him and like, brah, you ain't screw up big time. That's my translation, by the way. Because what, what is he saying? He's saying exactly what Lucifer was trying to do. I will ascend it to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. So what is he saying? I'm going to take God's seat. I'm going to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So what does God do? <laughs> uh, watch what I do to you after, you monkey. All right. He makes us sit where Lucifer desired to sit. Through all of this redemption, he has us now where Lucifer desired to be. Is it any wonder why Satan, the fallen Lucifer, hates us so much? Because of our seated position. The one that he coveted and wanted. We have it. And we act like we know more. And we thought, oh, the devil, the devil is a liar. How come you down there listening to the devil? When you used to be seated well? In heavenly places. In Christ Jesus where you don't hear the devil. Amen. All right, it's so all of you. And anytime you get tempted, what do you do? Yeah, that was a lot. That means you're not sitting in a rested position in heavenly places. You shouldn't even get tempted. Amen? Next time you get tempted to do something, do the opposite. When he tempts you to smoke weed, go smoke the candy cigarette. <laughs> the one where you know inhale, because if you inhale, you choke. You got to blow out for make smoke. <laughs> you guys remember those? <laughs> We all thought we were something eh, with that packed gum cigarette. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you don't can inhale because you're going to hack yourself to death worse than a cancer patient. Eh? So you blow out, make like you're smoking. <laughs> oh, look, I'm playing here. Yeah, anyway, what? Hallelujah. When you get tempted to eat a whole Chantilly cake, you eat only half and give me the other half. Okay? <laughs> Eat vegetables. It's like, yeah, right. Most of us, the like, teeth are all shot. We cannot chew on carrot. We gotta chop them small. We gotta shave them down. <laughs> uh, how many of you aspire to be healthier? You gotta believe yourself healthy first, right? Healthy people eat like this. Unhealthy people eat like this. I'm an unhealthy person trying to be healthy. I don't know which one for eat. That's why you, your mind is all confused before you even begin. That's why you think about it. Healthy people, what do healthy people do? Hmm. I don't know. They wear tights. They show off all their goods and bads. And they run. Or they bike. If I put on one of those. Anyway, that ain't happening. So I got to think to myself, okay. I can be healthy in my mind. Amen. Right now, how about this? I'm slowly weaning myself off of donuts. So I cut it down to half. Oh, <laughs> and the other half of my healthy living is Cheetos. Hey, it's corn. Shut your mouth. <laughs> Don't get me started with the Cheetos puffs. 
These kids, they offer me Cheetos, crunchy Cheetos. I look at that like, what, what, are you trying to make fun of me? Are you trying to back up with me? Uh, that one, uh, I don't like it. It's, it's the mistakes is the way I look at it. How do you think Cheeto Crunchy got invented? Because they didn't cook them too long. I'm not dumb. <laughs> I'm going to eat rejects. Then they put flaming hot on them for act like they made the mistake, the best thing ever. Still a mistake. Right? Come on, man. I just played. Some of you like, you like what you like, right? Some people like the crunches. I like the pops. Shut up. Okay. Don't try and tempt me with that other thing. You know what is the travesty in all of this? You buy those big bags of chips, the mixed bag, and they put only three bags of Cheeto Puff in there. I like call the company. And it's not snapping because they put five bags of the crunchy. That's how you know it's mistakes. All the mistakes, they over exaggerate the mistakes. Cheeto Puffs are perfect. See, you guys don't think like me. You better start. <laughs> don't sell us your mistakes. All right, okay. You guys okay? <laughs> See, these are things that I think about long and hard. Why the crunchy and why are they so misshapen? That's the mistakes. I know it. That's the ones that fell off the side of the pumper. And somebody said, oh, they're just as good. You know what, guys? Just as good is not the best. I can make malasadas and all the crumbs. I can sell that as crunchy malasadas. But will I do it? No, because it's a mistake. Don't get me started. I told you. Some of you are challenging me. Tell us your theory. I'll tell you my theories. Anyway. Now where are we? You see how we get lost because of you guys' heads challenging my intellect? Anyway. <laughs> you can see all of these, right? Okay. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be, here's the biggest lies Lucifer ever told himself. I will be like the most high. Yeah, okay. He did, but not in heaven. Someplace else with a third of his angels. Amen. Fallen angels, demon spirits. I mean, you know, he's the king of that kingdom. And he does a pretty good job in our, on our brain cells. All right. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol. You guys know what Sheol is? It's hell. It's hell. To the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you. Now, remember this. A lot of people ask me, how did you get the theory of Satan hanging on the cross next to Jesus? Part of it was right here because this was pre-cross. It had to happen eventually. And this is where I kind of got it. I started formulating these thought processes. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man? Wait a minute. We always looked at Lucifer, Satan as an angel. But how do you know that on the cross next to Jesus was a man? And people gazing at him. And not just the ones at the crucifixion. It was the whole universe gazing at the man. Is this the man who made the earth tremble? Who shook kingdoms? Who made the world as... You guys get in this? What is a wilderness? It's an un unkept garden. So the unkept garden is in the Garden of Eden. It's outside of the garden, the wilderness, where Jesus had to be tempted. I hope you guys follow in my intellect because it's not only about Cheetos. <laughs> Hello. Who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities who did not open the house of his prisoners. Because how many know that his fallen angels are stuck in hell? Hallelujah. Okay, we'll stop. You guys good? You got it? Who hung on the cross next to Jesus? Satan and... Adam. That's how we got the fallen Satan who's hanging on the cross. He has to pay for his crimes too. Adam committed crimes. 
So Jesus hung in the middle of both of them, and I think if they had to nail Jesus' hands to the cross, otherwise he was more likely to slap both their heads. <laughs> Amen? All right. Like, pack, pack, I win. All right. Back to the notes. Hallelujah. So man was again created to have dominion, dominion and establish the kingdom of God on earth. Satan wanted to be like God and he was cast out of heaven because of his desire. So how you know that all he does with thoughts is he tries to put false desire inside of you. Right? Uh, that was Isaiah 14. Right? Man has authority in the earth and dominion over angels. Really? All right. Let's look at the first scripture here. Ephesians 1. Verse 22, so you can see. And you can read right here, Ephesians 1, And he, God, it's capitalized, and God put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. Okay? Now, how many know that if you are seated in Christ Jesus, what's under your feet? Huh. That's interesting. That scripture says that everything was put under Jesus' feet. So if you're in Christ Jesus, where is everything? Until you put your head lower than your feet. You guys get it? So if you're seated in heavenly places, your mindset can drift off and come to a place where the enemy can drift all kind of thoughts through your head. And nothing gets caught, right? Because you think that that's how it's supposed to be. Uh, 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 uh. For the last few services, I've been telling you guys, let's look at this thing with fresh eyes. We're looking at this cold case with fresh eyes. We're not going to believe everything previous pastors, teachers, and leaders taught us because they may have been flawed. How many of you enjoy a nice computer, brand new, with all the bells and whistles? Everything's working great. It's high speed, Windows 10. Amen. 300 megabits per second internet. You like that? Or would you like to go back to 2000? IBM. Hallelujah. You know that most of the software now could not be installed on a computer back then? I was looking at one. It says 56 megabytes for this one software to be installed on my computer. And I was thinking back to myself, in the year 2000, I bought an IBM Aptiva. It had 1.2 megabytes. I was thinking, I need 56 computers just to install this one software back in 2000. I'm like, I good night. And I think to myself, I would not want to go back to then. I remember when you had to run software off of floppy disks. If you wanted to run it, you installed the backbone of the software, but you had to have all these disks, and you got to say, okay, this is the operating disk for this software. So the backbone is there, and it says, insert disk 27. 27! You got to go count now, all you floppy disks. And put 27 in, and then you might be able to run the software. And I'd be like, OMG. You guys remember the days of dial-up internet when it was first coming out? And you used to make those weird sounds. And then one line at a time would come on your screen from the internet. This is when Jesus was wearing diapers, man. This was back in the day. Well, for us today, how many know that we, as the new detectives, the people of grace, the kingdom-filled Christian, the Holy of Holies Christian, if we exist in the seated place in the Holy of Holies, how many of you know... And now we got to look at everything everybody taught us as potentially IBM Aptiva. <laughs> Amen. You guys remember MS-DOS before Windows? I remember MS-DOS just looking at letters and code. And you had to write all these. Oh, my God. It used to be like, oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. And then Windows came out. The first Windows came out. And all of a sudden, it was pictures. How many of you know that people like pictures? Mm. They like a picture of a window. They don't want it called Windows Windows spelled out MS-DOS. They want a picture of a window. When that came out, all of a sudden, the computers exploded. Why? Because people like pictures. So I mean, you know that you better picture this, the word, as a picture. You got to... So, some people that listen in, they always write this. Oh, that's the You make it plain. I can see them. Awesome. I'm doing my job. Amen. Because people like pictures. 
Because what do they say? What? Got to draw picture. <laughs> Local term, but does it make sense now? So if we're going to be the leaders of the whole thing, in the middle of the ocean, mind you, remember, where do we live? On an island in the middle of the ocean. How do you know that? We can send out a message around the world now that makes sense to everybody. Why? Because we're going to draw the picture. We're not going to draw the picture they drew because nobody can draw Mickey Mouse like Walt Disney. Amen? Come out in Jesus' name. All right. So if we're going to draw Mickey Mouse, we got to come up with our own mouse. All right? We're not going to call him Mickey. We're not going to call him Minnie. We're going to call him Manuel and Minerva. And we're going to draw this mouse, and it's going to make more sense than Mickey Mouse. It's not going to be Mickey Mouse. It's going to be for real. So if we understand all the pieces of the puzzle, other people can get it. That's why we record everything, right? Because in 500 years, when they unearth this flash drive with all the sermons on top, they're going to say, what was this? Then they can, they can try and decipher pidgin English. And they can say, wow, they really got it. And just think, 2,000 years from now, going to be 4,000 years out from the cross. Hopefully somebody got it. it took 2,000 years for us to arrive. Why did God send all of us here into this one place in the middle of the ocean? I think, personally, to figure out what all these lolos couldn't figure out all these years. And a child shall lead them. Oh, anyway. All right. So what is under your feet? Everything. What is everything? Well, you got to first remember your seated position is in the torn veil that Jesus allowed us access into to sit because a high priest could enter the Holy of Holies, but he could not sit. He had to work. Yeah. Us, we are granted the seated position in the Holy of Holies, and the whole thing is supposed to make sense to us. Say Amen. Because I can tell you right now, go watch Christian TV, listen to Christian radio. These guys still don't know what they're talking about. I promise you that. So if we can just dress regular and get it, that's good for us. Somebody's going to hear us eventually. Okay, back to the notes. Now, Satan is a funny character, defeated in every way. Uh, you can look here at Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6. Here's another scripture, Old Testament, before the cross. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. This is, again, if you understand it all. See, a lot of people like to point out the error in the word because uh, the word is Elohim. Uh, we're not created lower than the angels in the pre-cross, we had to rely on angels because of the fall of Adam. But now, because of where we are seated, we're not lower than the angels by any definition now. Even if there was an error, this was pre-cross. We were maybe lower than the angels, but not anymore. The angels are at our service. Not our disposal. We don't dispose of angels. They're at our service. So you, as a full-functioning, holy of holy, seated member, can direct angels to do whatever it is you believe that they should be doing. So can you post angels somewhere? Yes. yes. Can you have angels search your house and clean it out? Yes. Can you have an angel climb inside your head and look around? No. Because why would they do that? They don't want to visit the Grand Canyon. <laughs> but you can have an angel escort you, cor you know, corral demon spirits. You can call on the angels to dispose of spirits. You can apply the blood of Jesus, which the angels respect, by the way. And you can have them go and do your work for you. You don't have to do anything except direct. Similar to a man standing on a corner with a shovel. Nobody home. Anyway, sidewalk superintendent, yep. you can point your finger. Most of you are good at that. Amen. How many of you would like to supervise rather than improvise? Uh, well, you have at your disposal thousands of angels. 
You know that everybody has two angels assigned to you at birth, right? Right? One from Michael's camp and one from, come on, Gabriel's camp. So the messages are already there. How many know that the warfare is already taken care of? All you got to do is worship, which was Lucifer's job. There's only three angels named by name, Lucifer, Michael, and Gabriel. You're the, you make up the third camp of the angels. So how many can you have? Well, as many as you can direct. If you can't even direct yourself, why would you? What angels are you going to direct? They're going to be looking at you like, for real? You like us do what? You like us go kill who? You like us go rip all her hair out for what? <laughs> That's, remember now, if you really have this power, you can tell them to do anything. They'll do it, but what for? What's the benefit? Angels go and scratch your eyes out for talking to my man. Really? Mm. Hey, man. Yeah, for real. You guys all right? <laughs> you can direct angels to do pretty much anything, but it has to have an added benefit to benefit the kingdom. Right? Otherwise, you're just wasting your time and thought life. All right. Verse, um, again, for you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands, and have put, you have put all things... Under his feet. This was already pre-cross. After the finished work in the seated position, it's even more powerful for you. The angels are at your disposal. You can have them do anything you want. Amen. 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 I did this one time. I said, I call on the angels to go back and take all the evil money from all the evil people and bring them to me. It happened. A lot of money came, but all the evil people came with their money. They wanted their money too. So you got to be careful, amen? I would rather have the money come from God through people just deliver it to me, which is, that's the way it should be, amen? And all of you in here, anytime you put money into somebody's hands, you're entitled to a back blessing. Remember that. You can always say, Lord, this is my offering. My family will be complete and covered. You can do that, amen? Because seed is seed, amen? Whatever you believe the harvest to be. You can say, Lord, I'm sowing this seed so I get perpetually eternally divine health and your health begins to improve right away your body is designed to heal itself exactly. yeah but it has to have a healthy mindset behind it your money is designed to be delivered to you a lot of people are talking about the end time wealth transfer what end time wealth transfer the end was when jesus it was finished the finish means end People still waiting for the whole government to collapse so all the money can come to the Christians. Let me tell you this. You can have all the money in the world, but if there's no government to insure that money, it's worthless. What are you going to do? Light on fire for keep warm. You can't do nothing with it. You have to pray for government. Amen? Because the government is the one that insures the money. If you can have all the money. Even gold. What are you going to do with gold? You remember now, gold bars... 37 and a half pounds approximately per bar. How many can you carry around? Most of you tell the boy at the store, you can pick up that rice bag for me and put them in a wagon. 15 pounds. What you can do with it on 37 and a half pound gold brick? Walk around. Look at my gold brick. Okay, what that going to do? You still got to melt it down. got to become valuable to somebody. Even people with diamonds, what you can do with the diamond? Bling, 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 bling. Okay, now what? Now for my next trick, I'll put it in the jewelry box. Oh, I'm going to cut glass. Watch. It's real diamonds. Watch this. Wow. <laughs> Would you rather have a stack of hundreds or a diamond? Oh, the diamond is worth more according to who? These are how valuable diamonds and gold are. God paves his streets and makes walls with them. And you're over there. Oh, he, I need. Eh, it looks nice. If it looks nice, that's the value of it. Amen. Just be happy with that. Okay, everybody cool? Money is money. You need money moving in and out. So you got to push money out so money comes in. You have to. Otherwise, money doesn't keep coming. Amen. It's like leaves in your gutter. If you don't move the leaves, what's going to happen? Yeah, the gutter going to bend, going to broke. Then, 
Yeah, you guys know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, good. Back to your notes. I hope you're getting something out of this. A whole lot of information I never plan on giving you today. But nonetheless. All right. So man has authority in the earth and dominion over angels. Man was created in the image and likeness of God. You should know this without going there. But for the sake of those less fortunate, let's go there. Genesis 1 verse 26. Now I pointed this out. I don't know how many times. Uh, some people are starting to finally believe me that we're created in the image, not the likeness. Because in 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And they can have dominion over what? The fish, the birds, cattle, over all the earth. And over every creeping thing. Now, over all the earth, get this now. What are you created out of? The dust of... So I mean, know that your health is up to you. You got to have a healthy mind first. You can believe that you have dominion over the birds and the fish, yeah, over the cattle. But if you don't believe you have dominion over the earth, which is what you are made of, then you're already behind the eight ball, right? You, you're always seeking something that you already have. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, okay? You guys see it? Verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Nowhere in there does it say he did and created them in the likeness. So the likeness is a mindset that is formulated over time and wherever you come from. All of you believe that the sky is blue. Amen? How many know that the sky is blue because of what? The truth is the sky not blue. You just see blue. Amen. Hallelujah. Why do you see blue? Because of the light. The prism, right? The refraction of the light. How many of you believe that wind is powerful? But the Bible says no man has ever seen the wind. You only see the effects of the wind. So everything is not as it seems. You cannot stand on the hill and say, Ho, oh, try look at the wind. We do that. We say it. Oh, look at this wind. You're not really seeing the wind. What are you seeing? The tree, the leaves, the kite, I don't know, the bird flapping. Oh. You see dust in the air. Oh, look at the You cannot see wind. You see everything else, right? So, oh, look at my money. Oh, wait. No, you have money. It just hasn't manifested. You have the riches of the kingdom of God. You have everything at your disposal. You just got to believe that it's going to appear like the blue in the sky or the leaves in the wind. Right? You're going to see the effects of your belief system. You guys cool with that? Don't chase anything. Let it chase you. Amen. Hallelujah. One time I was playing golf at Banyan Golf Course. Yeah? And my dad, my dad was funny. This was one of the last times I was playing golf with my dad. And he was telling me, oh, I got to pay for you. I said, no worry, I'll pay you back after I've, I did the old, I forgot my wallet trick. Because he had told me the day before, I'll go take you golf. We go golf. I'll go pay for you. Said, okay, we go. And that day, all of a sudden, my dad is like this. He's Chinese by choice. So we get to the golf course. Oh, what? You don't want money? Yeah, I bet you know what you want. Again. I got to pay for you. I said, I'll pay you back then since you're crying about it. Well, I call it, man. Anyway, because I would say those things out of my breath. Bloody holy water. And then after, on the golf course, by the second hole, he was like, No, don't forget. You got to pay me back. You know? I'm like, oh, my God. I never don't use Chinese. I know my mother Chinese. You must have rub off on you. Anyway, we're driving from the second hole. We tee off. I'm driving along. And then I, I look, and I, I see a $100 bill on the ground. And I was like, I pick it up. And it was wet because it was in the morning. And I'm looking around for the owner, and I say, there is no owner. It was here all night. <laughs> look at water on top. And then my dad see I have it in the sun on the golf cart, trying to dry it out a little bit. He goes, see, you had money. I go, I know money always delivers itself to me. He's like, well, deliver them to me. I say, wait till I make change. Holy man. Anyway. 
I gave him afterward. I bought him lunch. He goes, oh, it must be a miracle. The man of God buying me lunch today. This is the kind of stuff I have to put up with with this white man. Anyway. But then he said, how you got that hundred? I said, the thing just showed up on a golf course. Money always shows up. He's like, huh, better start showing up in my pocket. I said, you don't go to church, you cannot have. <laughs> but he was a believer. He always believed after that. He saw that with his own eyes. Because I had made a statement, money going to come, no worry, going to come. And I told him, money going to show up. Always, and it did. And he was like blown away. I don't understand. No need to understand. How many know that people ch- always try and understand and make sense out of the things of God? It never makes sense. Amen. How are you walking around after all the stuff you did in your life? You will never understand the goodness of God. Because look how many times you should be dead. Yeah. Think about it. How many times did you lose your marbles? Like at your wits end. I don't know do this. And then the answer shows up being like, oh, see, I knew what was going to happen. Oh, don't even act like you was all that. Yeah. The beauty of ministry is I get people at their worst. Once they get to their so, supposed best, they dig out. They don't come back for a long time. I'm looking around. Take, hey, take roll. Uh-huh. Take a picture, last longer. Wait, I'm gonna take you guys picture. So I can see who here today. Hey, Alright, bro. Anyway, alright. I am just kidding. Alright, back to the notes. You guys cool with that? Alright, as long as you cool with it. All right, so no likeness. Who's the likeness up to, boys and girls? Us, individually, all right? Likeness. How many know that collectively we are the likeness of God as well as a church body? All right. Hallelujah. Okay, man is created to share in God's dominion. Eventually, the kingdom of God will be turned back over to God. And that's when all, you know, you guys know that he's left the earth to the humans, right? We find ways to screw up things. Yeah, global warming. How many of you have been sweating plenty? This is the end of September. We're still sweating. Maybe Al Gore was right. Global warming. All you ladies with menopause at the same time are warming the earth to these ungodly temperatures. Put an ice pack on yourself or something. Us men are suffering. <laughs> you know that... Every day that goes by, more women enter menopause. That increases the earth's temperature. (laughs) Anyway, because you ladies can get a hot flash in the middle of a blizzard. I swear. Be like, oh my God. Oh my God. (laughs) Hallelujah. I was at this place, Buffet 100. There's a famous story that goes along with this. I was on TBN this one morning in Honolulu. I was doing this TV show. They were interviewing me. And there's, there was this place in Pearl City called Buffet 100. There's 100 items on a buffet. And I was counting. I was like, no, they don't want 100. They count in the manis and show you packets as 100. <laughs> well, while I was there, this lady was in the corner. And she was wearing one of these flowing big dresses she's like hot a bloody hot in there these chinese i tell you they don't turn on the air conditioner for nothing like us melt in here i was looking at this big lady maybe you should know you were she know she asked the chinese guy i need your walk in and the guy was like, she stormed into the kitchen walked into the chill box to cool off Oh, it was like, oh, wah, wah, the guy with the cleaver. Wah, 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 wah. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> About that same time, I'm over there, and it's my birthday, by the way. This is my, one of my first 29th birthdays. And I was eating, and I was like, oh my God, this is all going on. And then this other big lady was sitting there staring at me. This lady was like 400 pounds staring at me. I was like, oh my God. I, I, Awkward, I'm trying to eat a hundred items here. 
And her husband was a short, skinny Filipino man, about 5'5", five, five maybe, maybe soaking wet 120 pounds. What women desire to be. Anyway, but this lady was big and I was his wife and I was thinking of the Gary Larson cartoon when the lady was posting up the lost dog poster. And Anyway, I was thinking to myself... She was staring at me. And then she, then she starts walking up to me. I'm like, oh, my God. She like, take my plate. Guard it. Guard it. And she came and no, she slid me a note. And she says, oh, my, no, my name is so-and-so. I saw you on TV today. You prayed healing. Uh, tomorrow I'm going for surgery. I was like, oh, okay. She's not trying to steal my food. Okay. <laughs> Meanwhile, I can hear the Chinese still in the kitchen yelling at the lady to come out of the refrigerator. So I'm kind of distracted over here. Got a lot of stimulus going on here. And this lady, I said, oh, yeah, yeah. And she says, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to surgery because I have bad back pain. And I'm thinking, you're 400 pounds. Anyway, see, because sarcasm never goes away. That's the devil of itself. Anyway, she slides me this paper with her name. And she says, can you keep me in prayer tomorrow? They're going to give me an injection in my back. They're going to, because the pain is so intense, they're going to paralyze me from the chest down permanently. I'm like, what? Who does? I, I told her, Auntie, I know some people. What is that shot? I like paralyze them from the neck up. Because <laughs> they're operating that way already. They might as well go all the way. And she, she was laughing. She's like, oh, you're so funny. I know you. She said, no, but for real, they're going to do that. I was like, Andy, let's pray. I'm at a table full of preachers now. And one of them is a famous other preacher that likes to be famous, but she's very infamous. <laughs> And it's my birthday, and I'm, I said, no, let me pray for you right now. Because how many know you got to take the opportunities that, as they're presented? I said, let me pray for you right now. She's like, oh, you would pray for me in here? I said, yeah, my food going to get cold, but that's okay. I'm going to get a new plate after this. So I told her, let me pray for you. And I told her husband, he's going to stand behind her and catch her. I'm like, not a good idea. And he's like, huh? You, you, you sure are. I said, no. I said, don't even touch her, okay? Just stand there and smile. <laughs> well, he had on a baseball hat, you know, kind of Filipino hat with a thing barely touching their forehead. You can see most side of the, above the ear. Because Filipinos don't like shoveling down on their head because it's got to last them 50 years, these hats. And they tuck in the top, you know, look like Abraham Lincoln's hat on the top. I don't know why Filipinos do that kind boy. I don't know that kind like the, oh yeah, you guys see I was, that's about how big she was, and that's the husband, about that size. And let me tell you the rest of the story so you get the full picture. I told him, do not touch your wife. <laughs> Oh, no, uncle went right behind, and I don't know, I was praying for her, and she fell out under the power of God. Ah! She made one of those Portuguese ladies on. Ah! And I was like, oh, okay. And all the preachers, all of a sudden, they acted like they never know me. They all turned into each other. <laughs> Acting like nothing happened over here. Not even the lady in the kitchen in the refrigerator screaming. <laughs> I don't know where Uncle went. <laughs> I could see his hands and feet. Because you know how Filipino, they get one pair of sneakers with white socks and stripes. I could see the white striped socks sticking out. But I couldn't see Uncle. And I could hear... I was like, oh my God, roll her off. <laughs> And uncle came out, and he was discombobulated like he just got hit by the, the boss. <laughs> and he was like, whoa. And he go, oh, powerful. I go, see, sarcasm never stops. I'm thinking, which part was powerful? Your wife landing on you, and you got to bury yourself out. <laughs> and he's like, oh, and his hat, oh, my God, went bent. 
all the worst sin that ever happened in the history of Honolulu. I promise his hat, the bill went bent. And he was like, oh, never mind the wife, never mind the screaming lady, never mind this table of preachers ignoring me on my birthday. He's fixing his hat. Oh, I got to buy a new one. His wife is out. Then she gets up. You never seen a 400-pound lady jump to her feet, start running around the restaurant. The Chinese guy was trying to call 911, but he couldn't find the 11 on the phone. <laughs> and like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm. And they ignore the lady in the freezer. The lady is sprawled out. There's like 100 people in this restaurant. She jumps up. She starts screaming, Hallelujah! Praise Jesus! She starts running around the restaurant and she bolts out the door and runs down the parking lot. And I'm like, this is above Sam's Club now. In Pearl City, right in that area, but by where Circuit City used to be. She's running around the parking lot. The other lady comes out of the freezer. He's still bloody hot. Ah! The preacher's still ignoring me. The husband fixing his hat. And I'm like, mm, can I get another plate? <laughs> she comes bolting back and he's like, oh my God, you don't understand. And she was like, honey, 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 I can run. And he's like, that's good, mommy, my hat. Oh, my God, these people. Well, she called up and she said that she got completely healed and restored. The other lady, menopause never goes away. She's still sweating someplace in Hilo. Every time I see the river running down by Mohouli Canal, I think of that lady on the top sweating. Anyway, the husband's hat got finally bent back where he needed it to be. And the preacher still ignored me after. And they told me, what do you do that kind in the restaurant for? You shut up, dummies. And that lady is healed now, Minerva. Manuel's hat is good. Straight, tucked back in. I don't know, some kind of Filipino Pacquiao flag thing. I don't know. Well, you got to take the opportunities as presented, amen? You take advantage. So this lady never had to have the surgery. She was completely healed. Last I heard, she lost a lot of weight. So now she's only 380. Praise the Lord. <laughs> hey, for well, some of you ladies, 20 is a lot. That's a huge accomplishment. You celebrate with on half of a Chantilly cake. Because, you know, they put the whole 20 back on. Well, what's the moral of the story? Well, you have authority and dominion over whatever it is. So when people submit to you for prayer, you have authority and dominion over their earth for a temporary short period of time. Don't think you own them, put them on a leash, and try to take them home. It's not how it works. Right? Okay, where are we? Hallelujah. All right. All right, so man was created to share in God's dominion. Eventually, the kingdom of God will be turned back over to God. How many know that he's given it to you, though, to function? Okay? All right, man has authority on earth. Luke 17, verse 21. Let's check a look here. I'll try and end this in the next 2 to 195 million minutes. Okay? <laughs> Luke 17 and verse 21, right? You all there? It says here. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Where is it? It's within you. Where's the kingdom of God? Within. And you are also in the kingdom of God. It's all one big package. You guys see, right? Verse 20 leads in. Now, when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. So how many know that it's not a place? You're not going to see it. The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there. Because you can't see it. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within. So you know that you are, I don't know, the governor of the kingdom of God. Amen. And you see it in Christ Jesus. So everything works together. 
Okay. All right. Some of you never even get that. You're like, ah, tell us another story. Okay. So where is the kingdom of God? Within you. Your heart is the soil that receives the seed of God's word. If you're lacking something in your life, prosperity, healing, or deliverance, grow it by planting the word of God in your heart. God's blessing is fertilizer. Some of you got it. That grows the word you have planted in your heart. The believer's job is to protect what has been planted in his or her heart. Okay, guard your eyes, everybody. Don't stare at me. (laughs) Guard your eyes and ears and monitor what comes out of your mouth. Don't speak words that are contrary to the word of God. Why? Because you want to be mindful of what you speak because that's what's going to happen. Whether or not a person dominates in the kingdom of God is determined by the type of seed planted and cultivated in his or her heart. Okay, next page. Satan uses the kingdom of God's system of seed, time, and harvest to try and exert his will in your life. So we have seed, time, and harvest. So does he. His seeds are thoughts. This Satan, which we're using, again, I say we don't empower Satan. We just are using him for the sake of the argument because everybody calls him the devil or Satan. So let's do it too. Satan tries to invade your heart with his words. How does he invade your heart? He doesn't come straight in your heart. He comes through. We talked about it earlier. It comes through thoughts, and he wants those to filter down to become a part of your tree. All right. He will use your eyes, ears, and mouth as entry gates to get his words in your heart. You guys cool with all of this? Makes sense? Don't let the world seduce you into thinking that words don't matter. The battle is over the type of seed you allow in your heart. So very simply, what you are, what you speak. You frame your whole universe, your own personal universe with your words. But those words only come from what you believe. So you can tell, according to Luke 6, verse 45 or so, uh, Jesus said, you will know a good tree by the fruit it it produces. So the fruit of your lips tells you what kind of tree it is. So somebody's always gossiping, you know what kind of tree it is. Right? Durian. Anyway... (laughs) Tastes like heaven. Something like, I don't know. What do they know? They say uh, smells like hell, tastes like heaven. I don't know. These Filipinos are crazy. Who's the first one that ate that? Like, oh, smells like rotting flesh. Let me eat it. Same as the boiled eggs. Oh, this smells like a part that left my body. Let's eat it. Let's eat this crunchy Cheetos and call it perfect. wrong with you guys all right <laughs> all right you reading along all right read along ding along okay the christian's weapons against the enemy are not carnal but spiritual cast down negative thoughts and tear down strongholds by speaking the word of god second corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5 all right here it is. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or external, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You ever hear Christians tell you that we got to we gotta tell the devil, we got to, yeah, and they do this external spiritual battle, which doesn't make any sense. Who are you yelling at? The enemy is defeated. Hallelujah. It's like yelling at your dog that's buried in your backyard for eating your slipper five years ago. <laughs> you know, you, Elio, why you eat my slipper five years ago? The dog is like, I'm not there. Anyway, the devil is not here, guys. He's defeated. And we're screaming and yelling. You hear people in churches all over America. Devil! And the devil's like, oh my God, leave me alone. I got crucified on the cross next to Jesus. Good night. See, we got to reframe our thinking. That's why I say we look at these things fresh. Right? What's the investigation tell you? Well, the perpetrator's all defeated and dead. Yeah, man. How are you going to do them now? So, you hear it. You hear people screaming and yelling in spiritual warfare. But what does the word say? Casting down arguments. So, what does that mean? Casting down arguments. How are you going to cast down one argument by having an argument? 
How are you going to cast down an argument by screaming at the sky? How are you going to scream at the devil who's not there anymore? Casting down arguments. How many of you know the greatest argument in your head is you debating what the word of God says? Like you yelling at yourself. You know when people yell at the devil, they're actually yelling at themselves for being stupid, for believing in... Oh my God. Think about it. When was the last time you yelled at the devil and what for? I got news for you. You were involved in the very thing that you're yelling at the devil for doing because you cannot blame yourself. You always got to blame the devil. That's what Christians do best. Blame the devil when they're the ones did them. Why did it get so quiet? I don't hear too many amens in here. It's because you were probably taught in another church or saw or heard Christians screaming out, Hallelujah, devil, you're defeated. You're you yelling at a defeated foe. He's not even there. Cleveland beat Golden State. You don't hear the fans in the arena in Cleveland still yelling at the Golden State team because they already left. We won. Yeah, Golden State. Oh, they're not here. Don't make no sense, right? Hallelujah. Okay, was that a bad analogy? Because most of you don't know what basketball is. Anyway, so you got to understand, right? It, it, it's all a figment of imagination. People trying to feel good about themselves. Screaming in worship. Why would you scream in worship? Why would you scream in prayer? Why would you scream at the atmosphere? Remember, if Jesus paid for everything, then the whole earth belongs to who? Us. So who are you yelling at if everything is defeated? You're yelling at the wind, hoping the wind responds. How about this? Cast down arguments, the one in your head. You know the number one argument you got to cast down is the one you have with yourself, thinking that there's an enemy greater than you. All right, you have mental spiritual illness. Ooh. That's the number one argument you have with yourself. Good versus evil. Oh, I'm good. I got to yell at evil. What? The mental ward is full of people like that. Yes. You want to join them? The only difference between the people in the mental ward and you is the pills. They go there for pills. You're out here thinking you need pills. Okay. <laughs> How do we know that this is all bogus, bullfish? Casting out arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every, you guys see it, thought. How are you going to yell at your thoughts? Okay, nobody has that answer. You know why? Whose thoughts are they? Yours. You start yelling at your thoughts, now they're going to put you in a mental ward. All right? Because what are these guys doing walking around downtown? Yelling at their thoughts. So what does the word say? Bring those thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Ah, hope it made sense. All those words for you hear from me. Stop talking to yourself. Stop yelling in public. You're making yourself shame. That's all it is. You're making yourself shame. Because you are yelling and what are everybody else who's normally functioning doing? You're in church screaming, ah, 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 and everybody looking at you. Like, I'm not participating with you. <laughs> I like this. I like being confident without being cocky. Yeah. You saw my you gave me the shaka. <laughs> I've never been given a shaka in church in my life. First time. <laughs> All right, we go with that. Confidence without being cocky. How many know that there's a form of religion that likes to be cocky and don't have any confidence? So we're confident, but we're not arrogant about it. Right? We're just like, all of us in here, if somebody acting stupid, this is our faith. That's the confident, like, what the heck are you doing, face? Like, you're not of our tribe, are you? When I used to work at the jail, we have one cell in the middle of the jail, 60 Punaheli Street, in the middle, with no nothing in it, no toilet, no mattresses, no, it's just a concrete room with bulletproof glass, an iron door with bulletproof glass, and a pass-through. That's it. All right. Now, how many of you know 
when you used to watch Indians, cowboys in Indian movies, the Indians all made a sound. You remember? Well, in this cell 25, there was a, a Japanese boy that was on drugs. He came into the jail, and we had to take away all his clothes, take away the mattress, the sheet, everything. No toilet in there. So, brother decided to do his number two in the corner. You know what that smells like when you open a pastry? Like, uh, uh, uh. I cannot even change baby diapers. Like that. Uh, I can see blood, heads off. I went to paramedic school. I can see people bleeding out, big wounds. But when that smell hits me, I want to just die. Anyway, I remember the, this guy. He was in the room and he was looking at the bulletproof guy because it's two way. You turn off the light, right? You turn it off, it's one way. He's looking at himself. And he's talking to himself. I see you. Ah. Then he went into his number two and made war paint. And he started running around the room naked and doing woo, 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 and doing this Indian dance. And I was like, wow. He's not Indian, I deduced. <laughs> so you can be anything you want in your mind, evidently. I'm sorry to use the grossest story possible, but it drives home the point that you can be anything you want. Except you can't be Asian and naked with doo-doo war paint. Making the sounds like an Indian that doesn't make you an Indian. Just because you yell at the wind doesn't mean you're more powerful than the devil. It just makes you more mentally unstable. Which is what this gentleman was, mentally unstable. We had to turn the fire hose on this guy. I wish I had a fire hose in church to turn on some Christians. The only bad part about cell 25 at Hilo Jail was there's no floor drain. So somebody got to go clean them up. And it's usually an inmate. Come here, boys. I got a job for you. And they're all happy. Yeah, yeah. What you need? What you need? That. One guy's in a corner turning pink and blue and orange. Clean it up, brother. That's why you're here in jail. So you can be anything you want in this life. Amen. Some girls, prom time, they thought they was the princess. I remember. They had more shoulders than anything else. Hallelujah. You guys know what I'm talking about. I remember this Portuguese girl and when I was in high school. She would ask me to the prom. And I was like, see, I told her, oh, thank you, but that's okay. She go, oh, I'm not pretty enough for you. The truth is I couldn't afford to go to the prom and neither could my parents. So I just told her, no, it's not it. She goes, no lie, because I'm fat. <laughs> I went to the prom. I was in the parking lot of the prom drinking beer with my friends because all the poor guys was in the parking lot. Can I go prom? What are we going to wear? A tea leaf tuxedo. <laughs> Banana leaf tuxedo. And then she came out and I was like, oh, that's a whole lot of shoulders over there. <laughs> Then she came, and then she hugged me. She said, it's okay. I took my cousin. Okay. Her cousin was a girl. Anyway, with a tuxedo. I was like, okay. But I was just thinking, that's a whole lot of shoulder. But she said, I'm a princess anyway. Uh, yes, you are. I just couldn't afford to go. Otherwise, I would have went because she was the first one that asked. Uh, my policy was if I could afford the first girl that asked, I'm going to go with them no matter what they look like. And then one of my classmates, his name was Alika. He said, I take you, prom. I pay for everything for you, Timmy. <laughs> this was back in the days when that was not acceptable. He wanted to climb Mount Timmy. <laughs> or should I say climb and Mount Timmy? That's not, that ain't happening. I was all man all the time. That was crazy. Because I take you from. I said, no, no, thank you. He said, oh. He told me this. I meet you after. <laughs> no, you're not. Now I know you're inhaling exhaust fumes in your car. You know, you know, 
This guy had a car, I promise to God. He was leaking exhaust. When it rained, we all inside. Remember those days, no more air conditioning, only had wind now. And the rag for the defrost. You was the defroster. You remember those days? This guy's exhaust. I remember just driving from Wainaku to Blue Lights by the old airport. All of us was like half dead when we got there. Like, <laughs> we was all near death when we reached there. Like, bro, I had to walk home. They're riding in your car in the rain. Oh, my God. This is Alika. Anyway. I thought about it years later. This is how he drugs his victims. <laughs> he gets you all incapacitated. Then he has his way with you. Anyway. Never again. Okay. <laughs> you guys are laughing too much. What are we studying today? Uh, all right. Thoughts. <laughs> Okay, back to the notes. <laughs> These are all true stories, by the way. Some of you look at me like, what are you come up with? Bro, my life. My crazy life. This is the best movie you ever heard, not saw. You don't want to see those. All right, Christian's weapons again against the enemy are not carnal, but spiritual. Cast down negative thoughts and tear down strongholds by speaking the word of God. Okay? Strongholds are fortified houses of thoughts that have been nourished over long periods of time. And that's exactly what it is. People have nourished your thoughts. They've created this belief system that you have that you have a hard time breaking down. All right? Some of you still believe that you've got to make the sign of the cross when something good happened. Thank you, Jesus. Why? You see it in baseball games all the time, right? The guy hit a home run, you're like... Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Like, okay, thank you, God. God never hit the ball for you. Okay. Strongholds will cause you to tell yourself, this is just who I am and I can't change. And that's what people, that's our biggest battle as this kind of church is changing thoughts. Words produce thoughts. Thoughts produce images that form the blueprint for construction of those images in your life. That's the manifestation. Desires are created by the things on which you focus your Attention. What you think about the most is what's going to happen to you. Amen. Amen. I pray for people every day. They always say, a lot of them, they say, Oh, I never thought I would get cancer. And then through the course of conversation, I find out that what comes up is like, I always knew I would get cancer. Like, wow, you cannot have them both ways. Your yin and yang is like upside down. It's all black and black. I don't understand. Right? People always say that, right? Oh, cancer running my family. I hope I don't get cancer. And when they get cancer, I never thought I would get cancer. Um, okay, the enemy really got the wires all boss. Then some of you caught the all boss. You guys know what I mean? You have the bus stop. What do you catch? The bus or the all boss? That was a joke. Hello. Well, wait till you catch up. You catch the boss or you catch the all boss because your thoughts is all boss. Oh, my God. Uh, I got to draw a picture for you. Honolulu, he says, the boss. Some people catch the all boss. Oh, my God. Still never care. You see people all the time when they look at you like, huh? They all boss. I never thought it would happen to me. But they, you know them your whole life, and they're always talking like that. Right? Hallelujah. I had a lady, she was married five times. She told me, I never thought I would get divorced this time. <laughs> you got the all boss. <laughs> She's all boss up. Now you can't. But the problem was, she got married five different times because she. Say, oh, boss, who gets married five times? They learn after the first one or two, yeah? Well, for her is, she never quite figured out that her mouth was the problem. Her mouth caught the all boss. Because her mouth would just rip guys to shreds. I would see the men she was married to, they're still walking around looking for the okole. <laughs> She tore them a new one times ten. As I saw this lady, she, my, my friend, that was his stepmother. 
and we'll be at the baseball field. I remember one time, my friend struck out. Okay, he's we we're playing baseball. We we're all little kids. Strike out, and he was like, he walked back to the dugout, and the coach said, "That's okay." She walked on the field, pulled the umpire's mask. You know you, you blind or what? Get your stuff. We're out of here. And my friend was like, the game just started. <laughs> she put him in the car and took him home. Wow. And he's like, okay, sub. <laughs> she like pulled her umpire's mask and she's trying to kick him on the shin guards. And we, the whole boys club field was looking at her like. You know what my friend said? No worry, guys. That's not my real motto. <laughs> he had to put the disclaimer in. <laughs> it's not my real motto. Okay. Where well, your real motto? Because this one needs to go. And that UFO got to pick her back up and fly out of here. Well, some parents is like that. Oh, my baby. I remember football. We were playing volleyball. We was watching, and my friend got hurt on the field. His mother ran from the stands all the way to the field, in the middle of the field. And he's like, who? Who did this to my baby? Who did this to my baby? <laughs> my friend just, see, my friend just got his bell rung. He had a... And nowadays we have concussion protocol and all that, but he got out of the Ma, get out of here. The only problem was his mother was behind him. <laughs> he could hear her, but his eyes was crossed on he couldn't see her. You know how some mothers are, right? I've been coaching thirty three years. You know what I find the most the most untalented, uncoordinated parents trying to tell me how coordinated their kid is. I looking at you walking with your slipper backward. You know can tell me your kid gonna be good. Everybody thinks their kid is the best. Mm-hmm. They all do. You know why? They're not at practice watching their kid digging his nose and eating his boogers in the corner. <laughs> people are funny yeah. I've been doing this a long time the reason I coach volleyball is because less parents watch volleyball than baseball and basketball yeah, I don't need to deal with the parents you know why? because they don't know what the ball is supposed to do they're like I hit the ball like they think it's beach ball kind of at the clothesline in the backyard <laughs> nope it's only when St. Joe plays Makualani you put the the comforter over the clothesline and we have the game. Anyway. I'm just playing. We have a good record. We have a winning record this year. Oh, there is a God. My kids walking around. We won? I wish you'd do that when we lose. We lost? <laughs> I got to take away the ropes, the razor blades, and the guns after we lose because... They know when they lose, and they don't, we won. Oh, we won, yay. Can we go to Fun Factory now? Anyway, kids are funny. Most of the kids don't want their parents there. Hmm? As soon as they see their parents, even my team, they look, oh, God, they're here. Like, for real? I said, why? Because when I go home, they're going to tell me how to play volleyball, and they never played volleyball before. Amen. It's all good. Okay. You guys good? You guys like my stories? Good. We'll talk story all day then. You know nothing else we'll do? All right. I'm done. You guys can get the copy of the notes. I'm I'm repeating myself already. You guys good? Holly.